Hi, I want to talk a little bit more about the Counter-Reformation. In the last talk, I spoke about the hopes people had for the Council of Trent, that there was a tremendous aspiration for reconciliation, for some sort of deal to be put together between um, the various rival religious groups. And churchmen, many were keen on a solution. The bishops were seeing their flocks disappear as um, uh, their congregations ran away. That's the term that they use at the time. They ran away, Auslaufen in German, to um, join Protestant congregations. Um, my church is ruined, says the Bishop of Hildesheim. Um, and political leaders, rulers, are keen on a solution as well. They don't like this religious discord. Uh, they don't like the constant violence that's going on because this isn't just sort of people turning up and going to a different church. They're looting each other's churches. Um, uh, they want to arrive at some sort of political solution to have some sort of deal. Ferdinand is most keen on this. Ferdinand presses him. He says, come on, allow communion in both kinds of the Pope goes, oh, for you, just for a short time. And then, oh, come on, allow priests to get married. And Pope says, no, we're not allowing that one. Um, and Charles V is most keen on a solution as well. He looks with tremendous enthusiasm. 1545 gets very excited when he hears that the first bishops are turning up at the Council of Trent and that the Pope hasn't blocked it. Um, but of course the Council of Trent doesn't live up to these hopes. It does the very reverse. And instead of it opening the way to compromise and reconciliation, it establishes a very narrow definition of what Catholicism is. It affirms tradition. It affirms all the sorts of things that Protestants hate. Veneration of saints, um, purgatory, penance, all of these things, transubstantiation, all of these things that, that Protestants find pretty unacceptable the Catholic Church affirms. So there's not going to be a solution. Now, um, what do you do if there's not going to be a solution? You've still got two rival blocks, or as Evans reminds us, and as he reminds uh, in the first page of his book, which I'm hoping that you're beginning to work your way through, it's not just that there's um, Catholic, Catholics and Protestants, they're all different types of Protestants as well. What do you do? Do you just give up and say, you know, why don't we all just live happily together? And that's the solution that's adopted in Poland in the 16th century, and it's adopted in Transylvania in the 16th century. And actually, I mean, Catherine de' Medici would probably have liked that option in France, but she's dealing with some tough characters, the Guises, who are not going to um, uh, give way at all when it comes to uh, the Catholic faith. And people like Coligny, the Protestant Huguenot leader, who's in touch with the Dutch rebels and um, running guns and troops across the border. And so she's not going to get away with that. So in the end, she, she massacres the Protestants in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And that is the alternative to compromise. The alternative to compromise is a military solution. And that is what Europe starts to move towards in the second half of the 16th century. In fact, even earlier than that. When Charles V sees that the Council of Trent is not going to put together a deal, and that he's going to have to take the initiative, he takes the initiative by going to war against the Protestants. He's not a stupid man. He doesn't say, we're going to war against the Protestants. He goes and says, um, um, the Duke of Brunswick, Wolf of Bootle, is entirely insane and should stop pillaging the town of Brunswick. 
and I'm going to go to war against him and his allies. And he's completely correct because the Duke of Brunswick, Wolfenbüttel, is a fully authenticated werewolf. The sort of person who you can't really negotiate at all with. And he just uh, keeps on attacking the, the, the town of Brunswick when he's not howling at the moon in the middle of the night. Um, and so Charles goes and fights the Protestants under the banner of law and order. Um, and he's successful. He routs the Protestant forces led by the Duke of Saxony in 1547 at the Battle of Muhlberg. Uh, and five years later, Charles's position collapses because he's become too powerful and the German princes, Protestant ones, um, uh, go for him. And he has a nervous breakdown. Uh, and it's left to Ferdinand to come up with the solution that we know of as the Peace of Augsburg, which is, if you like, a sort of uh, halfway between um, compromise and halfway between violence. Because what it says is that for the time being, princes can determine the religion of their subjects. Um, only two choices are allowed. Um, uh, Lutheranism or as it's known, the Augsburg Confession, a moderate variety of Lutheranism, the Augsburg Confession, or Catholicism. Um, uh, there's going to be no hanky-panky with Anabaptists, Calvinists, or Adamites. And so these two options are allowed, and of course what it means is the princes then immediately start bullying their subjects, um, a process that historians call confessionalization confessionalization it basically means being nasty to people who believe differently to yourself and favoring those that do well, that's what confessionalization is really about uh, people who the discipline of subjects well it's the sort of discipline of um, of the dungeon chamber that they are imposing um, which means that Protestants can, can, Protestant rulers can, um, they've got the right to be Protestants if they're Lutherans, um, and Catholics have got the right to continue with their Catholic belief and impose it on their subjects. And then they do, there's a lot of force that's used to bring people around. Of course, um, the ruler in the Austrian lands, uh, and in Bohemia and in Hungary is a Catholic. Bohemia and Hungary are left out of the Augsburg, but Austria is part of it. Um, and uh, the ruler, the big man, the emperor after Ferdinand is Maximilian II, who doesn't really know what he believes in. Uh, and after Maximilian, it's his son Rudolf. And we really don't want to know what this man believes in because um, it's certainly likely to be very strange if indeed it's coherent at all. Uh, it's going to be a mixture. It's going to be a mixture of Catholicism um, with devil worship. The two don't go very well together. Um, the, but below the emperors are the dukes of the individual provinces or conglomerations of provinces as they tend to be in the Austrian lands. And Maximilian II has two brothers, uh, Ferdinand of the Tyrol, uh, a man of amazing strength, and Charles of Styria, a man of extraordinary parsimony. He seems to have run his entire governmental operation with about 12 people. Um, his court is frugal in the extreme. Uh, courts often were at this time. Um, uh, Maximilian is reviled for serving his guests horse hooves. Obviously, historians don't realise is this is a tremendous delicacy. 
Um, I myself have had, what you do is you boil up the horse's hooves and you um, um, fry the glue in batter. It's a delicacy and I can certainly recommend it. Um, I've had it in Budapest on a number of occasions, but I used to go to Budapest more specifically to have it. Um, but anyway, uh, these are both devout Catholics. And in the 1570s, 1574 comes to mind, uh, they have a very famous meeting, the meeting at Munich, where they meet up with Maximilian of Bavaria, their old enemy, the Bavarians and the Habsburgs do not get on. And um, Maximilian is an even more devout Catholic than the brothers. I mean, he and his son have signed an oath of dedication to the Virgin written in their own blood. I've seen copies of it. Um, rather, rather extreme thing to do, really. Um, you certainly have to prick your fingers quite a number of times in order to fill a quill in order to do this. Um, and the three agree that they are going to impose Catholicism by force. And they're going to go first for the towns um, because they reckon they're weak. And then they'll go for the nobility. They'll do it slowly and they'll use all sorts of little techniques. They won't go into a full stage confrontation. What they'll do instead is um, crack down on um, uh, um, churches that are too noisy. They'll crack down on um, school textbooks. They'll do it incrementally. And they reckon that they can run a policy of divide and rule. And this is what they do. They start in, Ferdinand starts in the Tyrol. He goes for the miners. Miners are um, uh, obviously German in the Tyrol. They're, um, they're usually immigrants as well, um, which explains the fact that they just simply go off and go back home and Ferdinand's mining industry collapses. Um, but nevertheless, he's got rid of, he's got rid of the, the core Protestant element. And uh, Charles of Styria starts on the conversion of the areas he rules, which are obviously Styria, but also include Carniola, Slovenia, and Carinthia. These Styria, Carinthia, Carniola are often known as Inner Austria because they sort of um, nestle inside it somehow. And um, they start off the towns. There is some resistance. There's resistance in Styria in 1590. There's an outbreak sort of rioting. But the towns come into line and then they work on the countryside and go for the villages. And the normal technique that they use is um, what are called reform commissions, which sounds very nice indeed, doesn't it? Reform commissions. We're just going to improve a little bit of things, get things a bit more streamlined. No, no, these are um, uh, religious missions backed up by troops. And they search people's houses for Protestant literature. They close down churches. They um, hand back churches to the Catholics. They um, crack down on um, activities in woods because if you're a Protestant, you've been kicked out of your church. You meet in the woods, and you, um, uh, or in, in in the edge of fields. They crack down on that. They dragoon people. They do a quick blessing of a pond, then throw people in and say they've been baptized. Um, and they demand to see evidence of confession so that when you go to confession you have to obtain a little bit of paper to say you've confessed and you have to keep that bit of paper and wave it around doubtless we're all going to experience this when vaccination is made compulsory or that you'll find you can't buy a train ticket without waving a vaccination certificate um, 
and it's, it's a reasonably reasonably straightforward and reasonably um, um, streamlined conversion it starts 1570s by about the 1590s it's it's complete in inner Austria and in um, uh, the Tyrol and they're moving into uh, lower Austria they're moving into cities like Krems um, Steyr uh, and um, uh, beginning to convert in lower Austria as well so they're beginning to, to make moves um, this is if you like the hard line of the counter-reformation of counter-reformation practice but there's stuff going on as well and all the books will go on about the foundation of new religious orders um, and the one they home in on always is the Jesuits but there are other religious orders as well I'll mention just two the Capuchins um, whence the term cappuccino referring to the uh, uh, white hood on a brown habit that the uh, capuchin friars wear they are a preaching order go around um, dressed as beggars they're supposed to be um, what are called mendicants in other words they beg for their food and for um, uh, uh, a few pennies they're not supposed to own anything um, and these are if you like converting by example quite frankly I wouldn't be too impressed to see some shabby person asking me for money uh, but anyway it was thought to be effective in the 16th century the Ursulines who um, managed to do seem to do the impossible they're in a completely enclosed order but they run schools um, uh, I'm not quite sure how that works I imagine that what is actually happening is that um, noble families are giving over their daughters to an enclosed life uh, or they pay to have them educated at a school where these nuns who never leave the premises uh, provide some type of um, education mostly of a religious type but the Jesuits are the ones everybody goes on about now the Jesuits are, um, are founded in the 1540s and the critical point about them is that they uh, declare themselves to be totally obedient to the Pope which means that they are answerable only to him and that means they can operate without an episcopal structure they can operate in places where the Catholic Church finds it difficult to go because the Catholic Church requires largely an infrastructure the Jesuits are operating outside an infrastructure um, and it's about saying people are answerable to the Pope means you're effectively answerable to nobody and um, they uh, evangelize in difficult and dangerous places like Japan and um, well, I think they're all crucified upside down or something horrible uh, and they also operate in if you like in the Protestant badlands um, but most of the time their interest is as confessors very influential um, you confess to somebody and they say oh, you know, they're basically telling you what to do if you're a ruler they're telling you what policy or who that doesn't sound very religious um, even Ferdinand II I mean you can't imagine more stalwart Catholic than Ferdinand II in the 17th century even his, his confessor keeps on ticking him off and saying he hasn't been religious enough uh, and they operate schools and universities uh, and they are into the business of education and educating the young and if you like preparing a theologically skilled and theologically expert cadre of priests um, or if they're not going to be priests they're going to be men of influence and 
they are laying the intellectual foundation for the next generation. They are providing a group of people, priests, future rulers, future councillors, future town mayors, and preparing them for government and for influence. And the Jesuits um, are influential, but we shouldn't over-exaggerate it because the Jesuits always over-exaggerate how tremendously influential they've been. And their enemies always over-exaggerate them as well as being a sort of dreadful force, a conspiratorial force, a mix of... Um, uh, um, sort of Illuminati linked in to um, uh, the elders of Zion and linked into the uh, American international finance uh, and the Vatican Bank. So that was good. Even if you check, you go to Google and put in. Jesuits Illuminati, you'll find a load of uh, a load of rubbish coming out there. Um, but I, I think there's a danger in overlooking the and looking too and estimating too high these religious orders. There are other people at work, and I think in Central Europe, the role of the bishops has been greatly underestimated, because the bishops are critically in charge of the priesthood, making sure that priests are up to the job. For most education, most education is done in cathedral schools and in church schools. You've got to get this right. It's all very well going on about the great university of Ingolstadt run by the Jesuits, but only a few people are trickling through that institution. Um, much more important, uh, schools lower down the hierarchy because more people are going through them um, and the bishops are interested in education interested in spreading catechisms i.e schemes of faith very simple ones that you can learn off by heart so you know what you should believe in they're very keen on um uh, getting decent textbooks into schools having proper teachers all the time the teachers the the bell ringer who in his spare time and he's not ringing bells gives a few lessons and he may not even be really very literate um getting rid of people like that and putting in people with university degrees um and also establishing seminaries where priests can be trained and the bishops are in the forefront of this activity and they're in the forefront as well of empowering these reform commissions that go around in the countryside they are part and parcel of the archduke's conversion scheme um, and they also run the inquisitions now everybody has an inquisition the spanish inquisition and for those of you who don't know it, there is the wonderful Monty Python sketch, Nobody Expects the Spanish Inquisition, um, which indicates the sort of common or garden view of the Inquisition as um, a group of very unpleasant people who go around torturing um, in order to save people's souls. Um, and it operates in Spain. Um, the inquisitions that are running throughout Central Europe should be called investigations, really. And they're investigating what the ordinary people are doing and you know, um, seeing where there's a need for priests, seeing where there's laxity, seeing what varieties of misbelief are practiced and checking up particular people's sexual morals because um, <clears throat> it was tremendous belief but uh, amongst the Catholics that if you are loose theologically 
then you are going to be loose morally as well. So checking up on morals becomes particularly important, and also sexual morality in particular. Um, a lot of um, uh, funny stuff going on in villages. Um, uh, Make Charlie very keen on hunting down homosexuals. Um, and then when they've found them, they have to, obviously they tell them that their soul is completely compromised. Um, then they hand it over to what's called the secular arm for punishment. And the secular arm is normally um, uh, courts of very experienced or sometimes very inexperienced lawyers and um, peasants who come along as a, sort of lay assessors. They really can't put up with much of this truck. Um, they normally say, oh, he's, oh, I'm sorry, he's probably sleepwalking, or he did it in a fit of mental derangement to let him off. Um, uh, normally, they, the, 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 there's, there's very little actual punishment of um, deviancy of any sort, really unpleasant punishments. Um, and on top side by side with this, they organise visitations. Visitations are where they check up on the, on the clergy and make sure they're doing their task properly. Um, and they report, and they've got all their documents of, you know, they visited this and this parish, and the priest barely knows how to read, and he's living with a woman or several women, and there's one lovely one which I enjoy, which is that the priest has been consorting with a prostitute. And he says, yes, but it's only at night. And when I finish with her, I pay her off, and I don't see her again all day. So um, that's the sort of thing that they're, they're dealing with, and they're cleaning up the church. The Counter-Reformation is about power. But at the same time, by looking too much at power, and by looking too much at Jesuits, we will miss what is going on on the everyday, if you like. Um, in ordinary people's lives and how they are being slowly brought back to the Catholic faith. Thank you.